The first thing that strikes you as you walk through the door of this isolated rural church in Norfolk is the painting that covers nearly all the surface of the north wall over there. A mural on a grand scale that was painted here over 700 years ago. With flamboyant strokes in a reddish brown, the artist painted a grapevine curling in great loops along the entire length of the lower part of the wall. The vine scroll is punctuated with bunches of grapes and above, reaching right up to the roof there, there are rectangular panels containing life-sized painted figures which David Park has been having a good look at. Well, the clearest scene is the one right at the east end of the north wall and that shows on the right you see a standing figure of Christ with his halo and holding a cross staff with a little banner of the resurrection coming off from it. Yes. And then in front of him there's a kneeling figure with his arms stretched forward towards Christ and indeed Christ's hand is actually holding him by the wrist. Mm -hmm. And this is clearly the scene of the incredulity of St Thomas, of doubting Thomas. You might be able to make out that there's a standing figure on the left with a halo and a cross and on the right hand side there's a great big mouth of hell with the white fangs of this mouth um, showing at the top. And this is the scene of the harrowing of hell. After Christ's resurrection, he went down to hell and rescued the souls of Adam and Eve and so on. And that's what that shows there, the figure of Christ on the left and the mouth of hell on the right. The remarkable survival of that wall painting is the result of the Reformation. To cleanse the walls of popish imagery, they simply washed them white with lime. East Anglia is an area rich in ancient buildings. In Suffolk and Norfolk alone, there are reckoned to be over a thousand medieval churches. And as he goes in search of them, David Park's old station wagon, loaded up with enormous extension ladders, is becoming a familiar sight on the narrow country lanes. Yes, it's absolutely essential to use equipment like ladders. Um, most wall paintings are fairly high up on the wall, and one really does need to get right up to them in order to assess what condition they're in. And also, very often, if they're rather obscure and fragmentary, to simply to work out what the subject matter is and that sort of thing. Do the vicars look askance at you when you start hiking this stuff through the church door? Well, they do sometimes. In the past, it, people have either thought I was a window cleaner or something like that, a mistake which is very often made, or indeed it's occasionally led to certain difficulties in that rather suspicious-looking character going around with all this equipment in churches. Um, even one case last year when I was in the north of England where a chandelier was stolen from a church which I'd been known to have visited with my car with all its ladders and whatnot, and uh, I was practically arrested and had to give my fingerprints and everything. How many churches have you been to here? Well, I've visited quite a few hundred, um, particularly in the southern part of East Anglia. I've been doing a great deal of work in the latter part of last year in Cambridgeshire and Essex and Bedfordshire and so on, which I count as Eastern England for the, my purposes. When I am in the field, I try to do about five churches a day, so it comes to something like, let's say, 25 or 30 churches a week, of which about 25 will have wall paintings, which will need to be written up and photographed. Photographers from the Royal Commission on Historical Monuments follow closely on David Park's heels, recording in colour and black and white every medieval brush mark. It'll be an invaluable archive because at the moment nobody knows just how many medieval frescoes there are in the country or what the condition is of paintings that were previously recorded. Considering the hazards, it's amazing any survive at all. The major reason for the destruction of wall paintings in churches is probably the Victorian practice of stripping plaster and lime wash from the interior walls of churches to reveal the stonework underneath. They had an absolute mania for this in the 19th century. And indeed, of course, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, founded by William Morris, was originally called anti-scrape and was founded partly to stop this, this precise practice. Of course, one of the reasons why so many wall paintings survive in East Anglia is that in this part of the country, in eastern England, many of the churches tend to be built of rather poor buildings. Stone. Although they're splendid churches, they nevertheless tend to be constructed of flint or some other sort of rubble walling. And the Victorians weren't therefore tempted to strip the plaster from the walls, whereas in the north of England, say, where I was last year, where the churches tend to be built of very good ashlar stone, the Victorians did strip the plaster off and thus the paintings have been destroyed. Most discoveries are made on old plaster in churches, but since David Park started work last year, there have been dozens of paintings discovered in private houses. Only a few weeks ago at Debenham in Suffolk, David was called out to see some fine late medieval work that came to light when an old house was being modernised. But the best example of what can be found in private houses must be in the village of Horsham St Faith, where Robert Newell and his family have lived for the past ten years. They bought a derelict building from a farmer, which just happened to be the only surviving part of a medieval Benedictine priory. Mr Newell took me through the garden 
and round to the French windows. Uh, won't you come in this way uh, through these uh, French doors? And here we are in the what we call the wall painting room. You can see there's a gallery across the uh, north side. But the important point is this large painting over here on the uh, east wall. And it is a uh, picture of the crucifixion. As you can see, it's um, two stories high with these life-size figures. And underneath the crucifixion is a large frieze. It's really a strip cartoon showing the founding of the Priory. And it is uh, unique and as far as wall paintings go. When did you discover this? Well, the top part was known about in 1924, I think, when there was a fire here. The house was struck by lightning and a fire disclosed some painting behind the top figures. And this was recorded, uh, but then it was uh, sealed up again by the farmer who owned the place. And he, he drove battens and nails right across the figures and then uh, badly marked them up. Uh, but the bottom part was not known about at all. And what was covering the painting? Uh, the bottom part was covered by panelling, rather uh, worn and in some places uh, rotten 17th century panelling. And uh, I had thought there was something on the bottom here, but uh, I wasn't sure. And uh, one afternoon, uh, we couldn't wait, so my wife and I carefully levered off the panelling. And to our astonishment, we found this uh, giant expanse of colour and figures and houses. And uh, we could hardly believe it. And that was the discovery. And that was about seven years ago. That discovery established an academic trail to Mr. Newell's house, as the importance of the painting was recognised. For a start, it was a rare location. Hardly any medieval paintings survive in monastic refractories. The subject was unique as well. And with the rich colours of blues, greens, browns and yellows still strong and clear, the whole effect is stunning. That medieval strip cartoon tells us so much about the monastery itself. The founders of this monastery, it was the local lord of the manor, Robert Fitzwater and his wife Sybil, who were here uh, in the post-conquest period, around about 1100. And they went on pilgrimage one period to southern France, and they were set upon by brigands who uh, imprisoned them. And this scene you've just pointed to, the first of the really well-surviving ones, shows the robbers capturing Robert and Sybil Fitzwater at the front there and carrying them off to prison, which is this building here. And you can see the robber standing on guard there in his armour at the entrance to the prison and the founder and foundress of this monastery in the prison to the right there. Mm, one, one face there sh showing a good deal of terror. <laughs> yes, I think that's Sybil. Um, then to the, the next scene, um, you see Robert and Sybil Fitzwater are still in their prison, but they're praying to a little image of St. Faith on the altar at the right there, um, that she should deliver them from their captivity. So this is presumably the prison chapel. Mm -hmm. And then the next scene along, you actually see this large standing figure of St. Faith, much larger than the other figures, holding one of the figures, that it's not clear whether it's Robert or Sybil, by the hand, and re actually releasing them from their prison. And what about this one here? Uh, they're on a ship now, crossing the English Channel. That's right. Um, once they'd been delivered from prison and offered up their thanks, they made an agreement with the uh, Prior of Conque that they would, when they got back to England, they would found a monastery dedicated to St. Faith and um, housed at first by a couple of monks from the Abbey of Conque itself. And then in the bow of the boat, the two monks from Conk that they brought with them to found the monastery, looking a little bit seasick. Right? And what a splendid picture of the boat. All the details there. Yes, it is in fact extremely interesting, as wall paintings often are for, for this sort of detail. Presumably they disembark, and in this final picture, they're ashore and appear to be building this monastery that they promised. This last scene actually shows the uh, monastery being built, the large figure standing at left pointing down with this ordering gesture, gesture is Robert Fitzwater himself um, overseeing the work. And then you've got all this marvellous detail of the masons at work, um, for example, squaring up a stone of Ashler down there with their tools. And mm -hmm. also there's a figure painting one of the capitals. And there's this very interesting depiction of a figure wheeling a block of Ashler in a wheelbarrow. There's an article that has been written on this in the last couple of years on just this figure with the wheelbarrow because it does in fact turn out to be probably the oldest representation of a wheelbarrow in Western art. Information that art historians can glean from paintings like this adds greatly to our understanding of life in Britain seven or eight hundred years ago. 
Another fascinating thing about this wall painting is the way it was touched up and renovated over the years. David can point out where, a couple of hundred years after the painting was done, they changed certain details to bring it up to date. The armour of the brigands, for example, in the first picture was changed from chainmail to plate armour. The women's costumes were changed to reflect the fashion 200 years later, and you can see where they've added 15th century architectural features. Robert Newell is proud of these paintings in his house. Uh, come upstairs to the gallery here, up this passageway, and I'll show you this uh, super figure we found. It is the most remarkable thing. Uh, it was quite exciting. We thought that this was just a, a, a pillar, and uh, well, we noticed that the paint, instead of going round the corner, actually went into the masonry, and we carefully uncovered uh, the stones, and there was this marvelous face projecting from the stones. So we kept on going and found this mint figure nearly. And six feet tall. That's right, it is huge. <laughs> so, as you chipped away, those eyes, yes, the eyes perfectly and, painted, and, perfectly and, and preserved, were staring out at you. Peeping out through the broken masonry, and uh, we've had it uh, all, the, the pillar taken down, and actually she's been off the wall and repaired and put back on again. And the staggering thing is the quality of the preservation. Uh, almost as if it was painted last year. Yes, well, uh, that's uh, just the way it was when we found it. Um, it was walled up about 1400, we think. That is when the priory was modernized. It became a, uh, an English priory about that time, and uh, they resorted then to uh, new works and uh, simply walled her up because they were shortening the wall. And uh, it was up to us to find her again. The survey over four years, which is funded by the Leverhulme Trust, is now in its second year, and already David Park has detected a gloomy trend. He reckons that 50% of the previously known and recorded paintings have been damaged or destroyed since the last tally was taken about 30 years ago. A lot of wall paintings simply don't receive treatment because there aren't the funds available, and those which do receive treatment are often left in a half-finished state, in that the funds run out before... Uh, the whole thing can be conserved, and this means that many paintings throughout England are simply being conserved piecemeal over a period of years, even decades. And the other main problem is that it's not only a lack of money, but there's a lack of really good trained conservators. Uh, there are only a few conservators in this country um, who conserve wall paintings, and some of those are extremely good, indeed as good as any in Europe. Nevertheless, there are only a very small number of them, and they simply cannot cope with all the work that needs to be done. And the need is not always recognised. The Church of England's Council for the Care of Churches has a small budget to cover the entire country. Parishes like Little Witchingham, with only 15 households, can't subscribe much to the thousands of pounds it costs to do a proper job of conservation. David Park's hope is that his exhaustive survey will generate more interest and at least establish a set of priorities so that the most vulnerable of these works of art are saved from, quite literally, falling off the wall.